Hello and welcome to this candidates forum for the Massachusetts 27th State Representative District. I'm Joe Lynch from the Somerville Media Center and it is my pleasure to be moderating tonight's event. The Democratic Party candidates for the 27th Middlesex District are Katya Sharp and Erica Idahoven. Welcome to you both. Katya, how are you tonight? I'm good, how are you, Joe? Very good, thank you. Erica, yourself? I'm doing great, thank you so much for having me. Terrific, terrific. This forum is organized by three local grassroots organizations, Somerville Stands Together, Our Revolution Somerville, and Just Us Somerville. The Somerville Media Center is pleased to join these organizations in co-sponsoring this forum. The organizers have decided on the rules for tonight's forum, compiled the questions, selected the moderators, and have distributed the forum's rules to the candidates. Those rules are as follows. Each of you will have two minutes for an opening statement. You'll also have two minutes to answer each question and will be allotted two minutes for a closing statement. At the moderator's discretion, if you go over your allotted time, I will provide your opponent some additional time. And now, if the candidates are ready, in last name, alphabetical order, we will begin with Katya Sharp for her two minute opening statement. Great. Well, hello, Somerville. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Just us, Somerville. St Somerville stands together in our revolution, Somerville, for putting this event on. Um, just couldn't be more thrilled um, to be here. My name is Katya Sharp, and I'm running for the 27th Middlesex District to represent Somerville in the State House. Um, I grew up with parents who are serial entrepreneurs, working hard at watering Christmas trees, and also helping my dad pass out flyers in favor of a bike path in our neighborhood. The role that financial opportunities, access to health care and housing, and education play in an individual's life are not academic to me. I have seen it at my own dinner table and at every day of my career. My entire career has been spent as a public servant. I started out in the governor's budget office under Deval Patrick, creating permanent supportive housing to house fully half of the state's chronically homeless population. I was also using data and evidence to maximize the effectiveness of progressive social programs that we implemented. Right now, I'm actually working on mental health and substance use programs that would prevent unnecessary arrest or hospitalization of folks with those conditions, because I know what it feels like to worry that your loved one is not safe with their own thoughts. I've rented in Somerville for seven years, and I worry that Somerville has become increasingly unaffordable for renters like me, and even for longtime people who have been here for generations. I also worry that transportation is not reliable or green and funding has been discussed but not done for 30 years. We're also running out of time to address the climate crisis. So I wanna to go to the State House to put people at the center of policy and to use my government experience to make effective progressive change. Thank you. Thank you, Katya. Erica, your two minute opening statement. My name is Erica Eiderhoven. I'm running because I believe that we need to build a government that works for all of us. Uh, my life's work has been centered on reclaiming our voice and agency, and I founded the lead advocacy organization Fighting for Transparency in Massachusetts because for far too long, people like us have been pushed out of the political process. And so my work has been to support working people, find their power and voice, and exercise that power in the State House. I'm running in service of a movement. People in Somerville are saying loud and clear that the status quo isn't working. My mission is to work with all of you to address the systemic ways working people are exploited and disenfranchised, and notably the way black and brown people and immigrants are super exploited by our political and economic system. My worldview was shaped by my upbringing. I was raised by a single immigrant mom whose first job in the United States was working as a housemaid for a family in Brookline. And she was incredibly fortunate to later work a union job as a flight attendant. And it was thanks to her union that I was able to go to college and pursue my dreams. I truly am who I am because of organized labor. In adulthood, I worked as an antitrust economist and it was my job to analyze when corporations broke the rules of the market. And I can tell you they're breaking a hell of a lot more than that. 
They are intentionally taking over our public institutions. That is how, over the decades, they have carved out the American worker, bought our elected officials, and profited off our basic human rights, including health care, housing, and education, all of which exploits our racial hierarchy to continue the centuries-long oppression of people of color. And this is not an accident. These are decisions, and that is why we must reclaim our power and build a society that works for all of us and rectifies the historic and current wrongs of racism, classism, and other forms of oppression. We have a lot of work ahead of us, and I'm deeply honored to have your consideration as your state representative. Thank you very much, Erica. Candidates, if you're ready, we're gonna move on to the first question. Thank you. First question is in regards to healthcare. With millions of job losses occurring in the midst of the public health crisis presented by COVID-19, it is clear that health care must be a human right rather than a privilege conditioned on employment status. The question is, do you support a public single-payer health insurance system for Massachusetts that would replace private employer-provided plans? If you do, how would such a plan work? And how would you ensure a just transition for workers displaced by the shift? And if you don't support single payer, what health care reforms would you propose to deal with the pandemic? And I think we'll start with Katya. And then as we move on to the questions, we'll go back and forth. Katya? Great. I absolutely support a single payer option, and here's why. I support universal health care. In Massachusetts, we have a 98% insured rate. We can get that last 2%. It won't be that difficult. I also, when I Im implement a single payer plan, what I would be doing is addressing access issues that don't necessarily automatically go away with mass health. So our state plan is currently actually, um, you know, just as much based on cost cutting as the commercial insurance plans that we have. So uh, I've seen that up close and personal when I've worked with mass health folks um, and seen them actually talking about how do we restrict the use of certain benefits. So for me, access is really about investing in primary and preventative care, especially mental health care, and making sure that mental health has actual parity to physical health. Um, and that's something that I've worked on in my entire career and, um, and I'm really passionate about personally. So my single payer plan would address um, mental health and primary care first and really try to squeeze out um, a lot of the excess costs, especially around um, emergency care. Thank you, Katya. Erica. Yeah, I mean, this is an issue that is clear as day. I mean, we pay more per capita on health care here in the United States than anywhere else in the world. And to add to that, we have the highest rate of COVID deaths per day, as well as the last, the next country trailing after us, we have twice as many deaths of. Um, and to add to that, healthcare is not attainable, it is expensive. One in five residents here in Massachusetts are saddled with medical debt. And I saw this firsthand uh, when I worked in my 20s as an EMT, as an ambulance, working in ambulances. It was clear that I would respond to calls where the emergency room was the last resort, but it was not the continued care that we need to be providing uh, to all of our people here in Massachusetts. And so, yes, I 100% wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly support Medicare for all. Um, it is a system that exists for people over 65. We can expand it to um, everyone. And it's something I also think is something Massachusetts has led the way on that we are proud to lead. Um, we had the Affordable Care Act before the rest of the country did. And so why not start Medicare for all here in Massachusetts? Um, in terms of implementation and particularly pertaining around how we'll protect the workers um, is that I think we need to ensure that there are clear and um, structured job retraining programs because again, part of why we're paying more per capita is the high cost of our for-profit private insurance industry as well as our privately owned hospitals. Um, many of which are for-profit and have pushed for maximum revenue and cost cutting for years. And we need to ensure that anyone is displaced by this does get retrained, but we also need to ensure that that funding is going straight to the frontline healthcare workers. Because through this for-profit model, we have kept insisting on keeping our costs and staffing low, having the fewest number of unfilled beds. This is not what, it, this is what a market does in terms of solving human rights such as healthcare. And we need to change that system and we need to ensure that we have jobs retraining for anyone who gets displaced through the shift. 
Thank you, Erica. So is it fair to say that you both support single payer? Absolutely. Yeah. I got the nod from both candidates. Erica, if we're gonna stay, we're gonna stay with you and we're gonna talk about housing for a minute here. The Commonwealth's eviction moratorium expires at the end of August. Do you support extending it and do you support rent cancellation? And beyond the present public health crisis, what general policy reforms do you support to protect tenants and to make housing a right for all? Yeah, thank you for that question because it's something I reported on through my work in the State House um, that our current um, the current freeze or the moratorium on housing um, evictions and foreclosures is far, far too weak. It doesn't cost the state a dime to have this. And it basically says, if we have a state of emergency that is five or six months long, that basically the average working person who could not pay for rent because they couldn't earn money during this COVID crisis, that they would have to pay it back in an incredibly short amount of time. And that needs to change. So absolutely on extending that. Um, with respect to um, rent freezes, I am in support of the idea, but I propose a different solution because if you have rent freezes, you also need to have mortgage freezes. And that also means then the government is going to have to provide short term liquidity to banks. Um, and I'm in favor of instead of bailing out banks, which we have seen in, in previous crises, that we should be bailing out people. And we've seen this with countries that provide uh, to buy, you know, twice a month cash installments universally to everyone so that they can ensure that they can pay for housing food and any sort of basic necessities as people get through this COVID crisis and they're out of work because of the nature of this pandemic. And to me, that is a much more clearer solution than trying to do this sort of down the food chain, you know, addressing the freezes across, you know, rent, mortgages, and then, you know, helping the banks. Um, because my view is that it's a lot easier to um, get money or raise money from the wealthy and the corporations than try to figure out who is, quote, poor enough or cash poor enough to be qualified for this assistance. It should just be universal. Um, with respect to in terms of other housing policies that I support, I definitely support lifting the ban on rent control. It is about pricing stability and housing stability. We should not be exposing households to the kind of price fluctuations that sadly so many tenants here in Somerville face just down the street on 19th Central Street. The tenants there face a 30% hike in their rent in the midst of the COVID crisis. And that is something our state health should have stepped in on and hasn't done yet. Thank you, Erica. Katya. Yeah, I, I certainly uh, support extending the, um, the moratorium on evictions. I think, um, you know, this crisis is unprecedented and uh, we can't be kicking people out of housing now. Um, you know, I've, I've personally seen in my life how, um, you know, housing can be, um, can, can really be lost by things that aren't housing related losing your job, having a mental health condition that goes untreated for years and years. And when I was in state government, um, that was a thing that I was really trying to work on is how do you actually um, rehouse people who, are, who have been homeless for a very long period of time. And what I saw there was that people had been sleeping in their cars, sleeping in places that are not fit for human habitation in order to prove that they were homeless. And that's just not a way that I think our society should function. So what, why I'm really excited to run for this seat is that I wanna work on upstream prevention of things like homelessness. And so I would say, you know, we, we certainly need to make sure people aren't getting evicted first and foremost, because it's much cheaper to keep people housed than to rehouse them down the line. And so what I would say is we should also be increasing funding for the RAFT program, which is a program that the state already runs to keep people housed and help them with uh, emergency temporary assistance to do that. I also think that we ought to be increasing investments in the mass rental voucher program, again, which helps keep people housed um, who are in the low income um, space. And, and you know, it's simply just not enough um, for the people who need it currently. Um, so Katya, I think that's time on that one. If I could just follow up on that question. Sure. There were two key questions in there. You both eloquently uh, described what you would do going beyond. And I think you're both in agreement of extending the moratorium. Are you both in favor of rent cancellation? I'm in favor of it if that's the only option. I, I prefer the proposal I propose, but if that's the one option, I'm definitely in favor of it. Katya? Yeah, I mean, I would say that you uh, you can't cancel rent without also addressing mortgage prices. Um, so I would say 
yes, if we freeze mortgages, but, um, you know, I think, um, for example, stimulus payments like we've, like we've seen one of from the federal government could be a solution as well. Um, you know, I think that there are other options that basically keep the entire economy stable. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to the next question. It's about the environment. The devastating impacts of the ongoing climate crisis fall hardest on the working class and disproportionately on our immigrant communities and people of color. To confront the climate crisis, we need a Green New Deal for Massachusetts that recognizes that we can't have environmental justice without racial and economic justice. Is there a question in there? Did I miss it? Thank you. What values do you think should be central to a Massachusetts Green New Deal? What is one specific action you would take immediately next session? And what is one ongoing strategy you will employ throughout your term to advance a Green New Deal based on these values? So two part question. Let's go to Katya. Great. Yeah, so I'm uh, so in support of a Green New Deal because I think it does one thing that we haven't done very well in the past, which is to actually say, what should our economy look like in the future? We've had an economy driven by fossil fuels for hundreds of years now, and what should it look like in the future? I, I actually, one of my first steps would be to convene union leaders um, to talk about what those jobs specifically should look like. I would also reinvest in the Clean Energy Center, which has been un unfunded over the last several years now. So, um, you know, I think I think bringing labor into that conversation about what our jobs should look like in the future is huge. The in terms of the underlying values, I think it's really equity and justice, um, which really should be underlying values of everything that we do in government. But um, you know, from an environmental justice perspective, I think it's really about saying what is the overall strategy for the EEA portfolio in the state and how do, we, how do we weave environmental justice into the fabric of mission statements for those organizations and ensure that every decision that they make takes into account equity and justice. Thank you, Katya. Erica. Yeah, I'm in support of a Massachusetts Green New Deal. And what that means to me is ensuring that the communities most affected by climate change and the workers most affected by that transition lead the transition to a green economy alongside scientists as well as environmental activist groups um, and advocacy organizations. Um, that is to me the key value is around voice as well as equity, especially around racial justice. As we know here in Somerville, we are an environmental justice community because we, the I-93 runs right through a predominantly people of color and immigrant community that is one of the most densely populated. And yet for years, we have failed to put up pollution and noise barriers along that highway. Meanwhile, those barriers went up immediately in leafy suburbs where it's far less densely populated. That is just one example of environmental justice. And so when we, craft the Green New Deal. That is why it's so important that the environmental justice communities are centered and not just their voice, but they have power over what are the terms, um, along with, of course, the unions and environmental advocacy groups. So what that means concretely is, one, we need to file and figure out what is that Green New Deal convening labor, which has already been happening. There is a Green New, table, Green New Deal table convening together. And I've worked very closely with Sunrise um, and Sierra Club and all the different activist groups, as well as the building trades um, here in Massachusetts. So I bring that skill set of convening advocacy unions and as well as environmental justice groups together to craft the Green New Deal and push forth what their vision of that platform looks like. Um, and then I think the second piece is that we absolutely need to move forward on this. I mean, here in my work through Act on Mass, for 12 years, we have not taken action since the Global Warming Solutions Act in 2008. I did a training for Sunrise a month ago, and we had one of the participants tell me, I was two years old when that happened. You've done nothing in my lifetime. So this is something we absolutely need to vote on. We absolutely need to pass, and that is one of my lead priorities as your legislator next year. Thank you both. Fair to say, you both back a Massachusetts Green New Deal. The approach may have different nuances, but the agreement is there. We're gonna move on to the next question. Systemic racism. Since August 20th, 1619, the day of the first enslaved Africans arrived in Jamestown, Virginia, 
and through 401 subsequent years of slavery, Jim Crow, redlining, mass incarceration, and violent policing of black communities, racism has been a consistent thread woven into the fabric of America. How have race and culture affected your life and how would you have that informed your work and relationships with your public or your new constituents? Um, why don't we stay with Erica? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, growing up uh, as a person of color in this country, it is tangible how race shapes your daily lives. I mean, my first living memory is consoling my mom after other white parents made fun of her English and me telling her it's okay, you're, you still belong here. I mean, at that young age when I was four years old, um, I remember feeling like I was in a box um, in terms of my education and my experience. And so that the, the systems of just racial justice, per, justice permeate through all facets of our society. When we talk about racism and racial justice, it is an intersectional issue with everything from housing, education, raising revenue, climate crisis. I mean, it permeates all. And it's an injustice that is deliberately and actively perpetuated by some and most notably passively sustained by most of us. And so for me, it is important that you we take an anti-racist lens to every policy we look at. Does that policy decision perpetuate racism and perpetuate the status quo, or does it disrupt it? Um, if it doesn't do that, it is inherently racist. Um, and so we need to ensure that we look at the policies that we've institutionalized and that dehumanize black and brown lives with that lens. Um, and I also think it's also important to note that to check our white savior thinking, right? The long trajectory of black struggle and abolition movement in our country has been the driving force of shifting public consciousness and improving our lives, whether that's the Underground Railroad, Black Freedom Movement, Black Panthers, Black Lives Matter, and the movement for black lives that exists today. These are the people we need to be sharing and uplifting are their voices, and not just their voices, but their power in the room. And I'll just give one example right now, Liz Miranda, uh, who's a representative from Roxbury, is putting forth an incredibly important bill around saving black lives and decriminalizing our criminal justice system. And my belief is that people closest to the pain need to be closest to the power. It is my duty to uplift legislators of color like her who understand those injustices and push for their legislation. Thank you, Erica. Katya? Yeah. So as a white person, I want to acknowledge that that carries the benefits and the privilege that I have experienced in my life. I can't truly understand the experiences of a person of color and what they've gone through in their life. But what each of us can do is that we can learn every day and we can try to challenge our own assumptions. And that's actually a, a fundamental belief that, that I think is part of what makes a good leader. Um, not just in issues of race, but in, but in every issue in life, is we need to be engaging in public learning. Um, and that's what leadership is really afraid to do right now. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I wanted to run. I strive every day to learn from others about their adversities and to specifically understand how overt and implicit racism and bias drive systemic racism in general, and specifically how it, how it affects people in our community. And one of the ways that I've done that is that I've gone into the jail in Middlesex County and I've had conversations with folks who are incarcerated there. And I've said to them, why do you think you're here and how can people like me help to make that not happen in the future? Um, and I think those are the conversations that people really need to be having and trying to, trying to ask first and, and primarily listen. Um, and, and to speak second. And so um, one example of, of what I hope to take into this role if elected is um, to support the, the voices of people in Somerville who are people of color. Um, you know, I, I so appreciate the Just Us Somerville group um, that just recently came together is helping to put on this event today and um, has listed a list of demands um, about both how we change our policing culture and also how we, you know, actually address systemic racism in our structures and institutions. Um, one of those things is by making sure that we hire more people of color. And so I would be seeking to, um, to promote those sort of lists of demands and, and sort of ideas that are coming out of um, folks that, um, that are people of color um, and to really listen and learn. Thank you, Katya. As you both know, the 27th 
is a, a unique district. It is solely within the borders of the city of Somerville. So the organizers um, told me I had a little liberty here. Mm -hmm. And I'm just gonna ask you for your thoughts. Do you think that the city of Somerville in 2020 is a racist community? Erica, why don't we start with you? I mean, racism permeates all pieces and aspects of our society. I mean, it is the air we breathe. It is the smog that clouds our thinking and how we but think specifically, about it. Erica, I'm sorry, specifically, yeah. do you think Somerville is? Somerville, the city. I mean, I think we all have racism and white supremacy as part of our daily lives. That is to be American here. And I don't think Somerville is any exception. I think that's really easy to fall into sort of an exceptionalist thinking that somehow we are above this. Um, we are also largely, you know, white community, right? And so I think to say that, you know, Somerville is somehow free from um, racist ideology or white supremacy isn't true. And I say, you know, I mean, yes, you know, we've had these discussions around the police budget yesterday uh, that were so important. But the thing is, you know, there was sort of this argument that like, well, 17 million is a lot less than Cambridge and it's a lot less than Boston. Um, but when you compare it to the rest of the world, it is, it is absurd how much we're spending on police. And that's another piece is that it all ties into um, other forms of the, what health manifests in our community, right? And that relationship between public institutions and state authorities and our community is most broken, that social contract has been most broken between them. And I think that's still the case in Somerville and we have a lot of work to do. Thank you. Katya, is Somerville a racist community? You know, I uh, have been participating in many of the um, Just Us Somerville events and um, been listening a lot to um, what folks have had to say. And I've heard the stories about, um, you know, people of color working in our schools um, and frankly, I've seen, um, you know, the, that the immigrant communities that we have and the people of color tend to, tend to live in one part of Somerville, right? And, um, you know, so I think, I think um, to Erica's point, yes, the um, Somerville is not immune to the systemic and structural issues that we have in our society as a whole. Um, I'm, I'm actually just so hopeful, to be honest, right now that we are in a moment where we might actually see real change. Um, because I, I have seen so many people out in the streets of all different colors and creeds and um, backgrounds. Um, and, I, and I really see, this is why I love Somerville and why I uh, want it to be my forever home, just because, you know, it really is that community um, with a capital C. Um, you know, we have people out there trying to learn every day and, and trying to do better for our community. Um, so, you know, I think um, really supporting the work of Just Us Somerville and, um, and of other groups of color in Somerville um, is something I would love to see. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm just really glad that I, I'm really glad that I live in this city where um, so many people are standing up for that. Thank you both. That, that was my question. Um, I've been asked the question, as you both know, I'm around town a lot. And I've been asked the question by people who have lived here for 50 years. Joe, do you think we live in a racist community? And I'm asked by newcomers down the street who moved in last week, is this a racist community? And I think people want to know how their representative feels about their community. So the organizers may never ask me back for asking that question so bluntly. So let's move on to the next question. Transparency and accountability. Many bills with large numbers of co-sponsors never get a floor vote session after session. What would you do differently to help ensure that needed progressive legislation up on Beacon Hill actually gets passed? Let's start with Katya. Yeah, so um, this is a huge issue. It's the central issue in this race, and it's the reason why I think both of us are running. Um, you know, I've seen time and time again um, being in committee rooms uh, during hearings where you know, the governor gets up and he speaks for two hours um, and then he's done and the people who actually have the problem um, get to speak and no one is still sitting at the dais. Um, and so, you know, for me, I think this is a cultural problem. Um, you know, I think that transparency is a, a needed key ingredient in government. I also think that the reason that's true is because transparency is in pursuit of progressive outcomes. And so for me, I think the progressive outcomes are the real end goal as opposed to transparency. I think transparency is the, is the pursuit of that goal. 
So what I would do is that I would, um, you know, actually um, change the way that that committees are soliciting input from um, from citizens. Um, I would work to have more time um, reflecting on bills, and I would personally seek out um, the input of of anyone who is actually impacted by the problem in any bills that I'm reviewing. Um, and you know, in addition to that, this has been my entire career. You know, I've gone into big broken bureaucracies. And I've actually had conversations with people like corrections officers about why are why is it that we should be providing mental health services to people as an alternative to arrest? And what you find when you do that is that you can really build on their personal understanding of a problem um, and find mutual common ground to find a solution. And so this has been what I've focused on my entire career. This is why I think that I would be effective in the state house because a big broken bureaucracy is what is the criminal justice system right now, and that's what the state house is. Thank you, Katya. Erica. Yeah, let's be clear. Massachusetts is one of the least transparent legislator, legislatures in the country. Um, part of what you just referenced in terms of the floor vote, so I'll address directly that, which is that we have one of the highest barriers to getting a floor vote in the country. In most states, if you compare Ohio, New York, Illinois, um, you need one, maybe two, maybe five state reps to stand at once to get a recorded vote. Here in Massachusetts, you need 16. That, and they actually tried to raise that threshold from 16 to 40 earlier this summer in favor of some emergency rules for COVID-19. That is something that I organized, worked with legislators and advocacy groups to block. And we are I'm very proud to, proud to say we tangibly broke, blocked this incredibly horrendous um, move in terms of grabbing power um, from leadership. I should also add to that this is a problem that has gotten worse and worse over the time since Tom Finneran and the past three speakers have all gone to jail. Um, and this is something that is a structural problem because when I co-founded Act on Mass, which is a lead advocacy organization for transparency, um, transparency is a symptom of a broken system, right? Underlying it is a culture that I have a very a little different interpretation from my opponent, which is that it's a culture that tells regular people, working people, people of color, women and immigrants, stay home. We don't need you here. I've, you're not a lobbyist. You don't understand what's going on. Why don't you go home and do your own thing? And my view is that we are the experts of our lived experience. This, without transparency, we have democratic erosion. We cannot both say, I'm gonna uplift uh, the voices of black and brown people of color and at the same time say, just go home, you don't need to be involved in this process. And so I am dedicated, one, to the rules change in January of 2021, that is gonna be first and foremost, and we need to lower that threshold from 16 to eight, as well as make committee votes public. And I've led the way on putting forth a pledge that more reps than ever have signed. I mean, this is the testament of my work of bringing reps around a shared strategy. And that pledge just says one simple thing, er tell us how you vote. Erica, I think we're out of time there. So oh, transparency. Can I, respond? can I respond really quickly? Sure. I'm so sorry. You know, I, I just want to respond because I think that Erica made an insinuation about my belief system that is untrue. And I just, um, I'm not going to let that stand. So um, I, I believe that, that um, you know, more people need to have a voice in the state house. Um, and not less, and I'm not in favor of excluding people from any type of decision-making process. And um, I think that my answer um, was clear about that. And I think that my background really shows that that's exactly what I've done in my entire career is actually when, when people around me were you know, making decisions on behalf of others that they didn't have the experience of, I said, no, I'm gonna go actually talk to these people and say, what do you need? What, what, how can I support you? Um, and so, you know, I just, I think it's an unfair characterization. Thank you, Katya. Transparency seems to be the key uh, with both of you on um, if you are successful getting to Beacon Hill. Let me ask a follow-up question. The current occupant of the seat that you're trying to um, get elected to, in all the years that she has been on Beacon Hill, she has never once got an, a chairship because she has not played the game with the speakers. Are you willing, either one, if you're elected, to not play that game and not get chairships? Erica? Yeah, I just wanna state clearly and unequivocally that getting chairmanship, um, there's a difference between having permission and having power. 
Um, and right now, I would argue most of the chairs, and this is something actually a fellow endorser of mine, the former chair of revenue has pointed out very clearly, chairs don't have power. They have permission under the speaker. Um, so I would argue that in many ways, when people say Denise Provo did not succeed in terms of getting sort of what we call the wins or the rules of the game, but that's actually not true. And that having a progressive stalwart, a progressive North Star like Denise Provo and Pat Jalen before her is actually critical in terms of pushing progressive issues forward in the state house. And it's our responsibility. I mean, Somerville in this district is probably one of the most progressive blue liberal progressive state uh, districts in the state. Um, and so I think um, th that for me is not about earning permission. It is about building power. And the speaker is not all powerful, right? There is a system, there is, there is also the power of the vote, like the power of the people and constituents. And I can tell you right now, any state rep is gonna need Lipitor if they get calls from 20 constituents at once. And that's something we need to exercise moving hey, forward. Erica, they're gonna kill me because we're going out all over time. Okay. <laughs> but Katya, I wanna give you a little bit of response there. Yeah, so I, I definitely don't think that gamesmanship is the way you get things done. Um, you know, in my career, what's gotten things done with uh, these difficult institutions to crack is to actually go and have conversations with people. Um, you know, like I said, it, this is all about public learning. Um, and it's also all about meeting people where they're at and, and trying to get those progressive wins by, uh, by working directly with the people um, inside and outside of the organization. So, um, you know, for me personally, the, the chairship is irrelevant. What we're talking about is trying to actually get these progressive wins. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use every tool in my toolbox to make that happen. Um, you know, people don't necessarily have to agree with me on morals to agree with me on um, given policy issues. And that's what I've seen in, in corrections change is, um, is that, you know, you can, uh, you can actually build on a mutual understanding of, hey, maybe we should have less people incarcerated. Um, and, that, and that's what really helps. You know, I think we're also in this moment right now where um, change seems more possible right now than ever on things that I've been working on for a really long time. So, um, to, so you know, really investing in social services and preventing criminalization of people who don't need to be criminalized. Um, and I think that um, the outside game is actually um, very important in that. I mean, we saw that in Somerville when students at Somerville High School walked out repeatedly and they actually got um, progressive gun control legislation done. So, um, you know, I think the strategy is really um, an all hands on deck approach. It's leveraging the moment when the moment exists. Um, and it's saying, I'm not going to leave any tools untouched in making progressive change. Thank you, Katya. I think transparency is the key. Um, we're going to move on here. Jobs. The pandemic has forced many workers to choose between their health and feeding their families. Unsafe work conditions with weak federal safety and health enforcement, low wages that made it impossible for people to save up for such an emergency, and lack of paid sick time have all disproportionately impacted low wage workers, immigrant workers, and workers of color. What measures will you take to address these issues? Let's stay with Katya. Yeah, yeah, so you know, I think um, paid sick time needs to be made permanent for sure. Um, that's that's a given. You know, I've also um, in in my career been working, um, you know, so hard to to basically say we need to be paying more to get more value out of social services. Um, and I think the value is really both in the people who are served and the people who are doing the work. Um, because you're exactly right. You know, um, people who are on the front lines in healthcare um, and in these uh, sort of union jobs. Uh, you know, there are other ones uh, as well in the state. Um, you know, they're the ones who are doing the hard work and often they're doing difficult, dangerous jobs and they're not getting the credit that, um, that others uh, in dangerous jobs do. So, um, so, you know, what I would do is really um, especially look at healthcare reimbursements um, for places like community hospitals, um, safety net hospitals. You know, I would be making sure that they actually have enough revenue um, to pay their workers livable wages and to comp fairly compensate them for, uh, for what is you know, a, a job that's really difficult and challenging. Thank you, Katya. Erica. Yeah, I would say that the COVID-19 pandemic has really revealed to us how close to the edge many of us live. We are all one accident, one medical, medical bill, one missed paycheck away from losing it all. And COVID-19 is a public health emergency, but our complete lack 
of social safety net is not an accident and it's a series of decisions made by people in power. And so what I would do is we need to restore that. We know that through the past few decades, the American worker has been carved out. The current minimum wage is not a living wage. We need to ensure everybody earns a living wage. And so that's actually one of the things that politicized me and brought me to co-found Act on Mass was the grand bargain in 2018, where we compromised severely on the $15 minimum wage. We need to go much further than that. We know that's not a living wage in Somerville. And so my view is that one, we need to increase the living wage. Two, um, we also need to ensure that we're each individual in our society is paying their fair share. And right now, most of that burden at state and local taxes are paid for by working people. Meanwhile, corporations and the wealthy kind of get off um, without paying their fair share at all. And, to, and they actually even further get a ton of tax benefits in the order of billions of dollars. That needs to stop. And so for me, this question is a structural question, right? These are not about individuals pulling themselves out of their bootstraps. This is all of a series of decisions that have put our society and carved out the American worker for the profit of a very few. And so we need to ensure that we change, address this structural problem with structural change. And that is one of the big pieces. And the second piece I'll say too is the need and the importance of labor unions. Unions are who will defend workers. They are the form of democratizing the workplace that is needed now more than ever. And we have seen over the decades how unions have been carved out and busted and we need to restore their rights, whether that's the right to strike, right to organize and ensure that they are able to fight back in terms of fighting for their workers. Thank you, Erica. You know, we're, we're, the clock is ticking down here, so we're gonna do the lightning round, if you don't mind. And the lightning round, as you know, requires one answer, yes or no. Ready? Ready. Okay. The Roe Act, which would expand access to abortion, ensuring that anyone, regardless of age, income, or insurance, can access safe legal abortion here in Massachusetts. Yes, you support or no, you don't. Erica. Yes. Katya. Yes. Safe Communities Act, which among other things would limit state and local law enforcement cooperation with ICE and keep state tax dollars from supporting federal immigration law enforcement. Yes or no, Katya. Yes. Erica. Yes. Next one, the fair share amendment, which would raise revenue by taxing a portion of a person's annual income above $1 million. Erica, yes or no? Yes. Katya? Yes. Thank you. Extending in-state tuition to all Massachusetts high school graduates, regardless of documentation status. Yes or no? Katya? Yes. Erica? Yes. There you go. And finally, a ban on construction of any new fossil fuel infrastructure and removing all fares on public transportation. I think that's two different ones. So let me ask, Katya, are you in favor of a ban on construction of any new fossil fuel infrastructure? Yes. Erica? Yes. Are you? Let me just put it here. Are you both in favor of all fares, uh, of removing all fares on public transportation? Katya? Yes. <laughs> Erica? Yes. Finish the lightning round with no dissension. We are gonna move right on to the two minute closing. Um, how would you like to begin? Would you like to toss a coin that no one can see or would you like me to choose? Whichever works for you, Joe. I'll choose. <laughs> Erica, you were last on the uh, first in. So Erica Idahoven, your two minute closing, please. Thank you. Our crises and their urgency um, that we've talked through in this, uh, this forum truly guide me on what kind of leader I want to be. Uh, humanity has run out of time for half measures and incremental change. And my North Star in running for office is to think about how my children will look back on what I did. Will I be able to live with myself? And did I do everything in my control to address these crises, whether that be the climate crisis, the global pandemic, or the original sin of our nation, racism and white supremacy? To me, actions speak louder than words. I have been on the front line of these struggles in our state from supporting our paras to earn a living wage, for, from picketing with our nurses and frontline healthcare workers against Steward, who was violating their contracts, 
for immigrants to live without fear, and for housing justice and a livable climate. With me, what you see is what you get. And we are in a nightmare and we do not have to make this choice. Because we are in a historic moment. People are telling us in no uncertain terms what change they need. And this election is a referendum on the way we have been governing for the past 50 years. And it is our duty to rise to this occasion. We have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. Don't let anyone tell you that a better world isn't possible. We also need to be anti-racist. We need to be uplifting voices, experience, and agency of people of color. We have to consider every decision we make. Does it uphold the system of racism or does it disrupt it? And for too long, our political and economic system has broken the social contract for centuries and is our duty to restore it, to build trust between public institutions and our community so that we can build a healthy and free world. So thank you for sharing this space with me. Thank you to SST for being building power in your unions, to Our Revolution Somerville for organizing on progressive issues, and thank you, Justice Somerville, for standing up to deconstruct racism and decolonize our community. You're muted, Jeff. My apologies. <laughs> Katya, your two minute closing, please. Yeah, I'm running because I just love Somerville and I wanna make it my forever home. I've been here for the last seven years and I, through those seven years, what I've seen is that there are people who are new and people who have been here for generations and all of us have seen rapid, rapid change in our communities. And sometimes that can be really scary for people. And what I wanna say is we can leverage this moment to make the changes we've been talking about for a really long time. I wanna to go to the State House to make that happen. Erica and I both are seeking to make huge progressive change at the State House. That's not in question. What is in question is our backgrounds. And for me, I've spent my entire career as a public servant, and I've spent my entire career working inside of the bureaucracy and trying to tear it down from the inside and trying to make those big progressive changes with the people who are currently in power. And what and and I've also seen in my in my private life why these things are so important. I'm a renter, unlike Erica. And I understand why it is so important to for example have an eviction moratorium right now to implement um, you know the right to counsel in eviction proceedings because it's hard. Um, you know, I'm, I pay, I have $70,000 worth of student loan debt right now. My parents went through bankruptcy to discharge medical debt when I was young. And so these things underpin my beliefs in things like universal health care, making sure we have access to health care, making sure housing is a human right. These are also things that I hear daily from residents in Somerville, from my neighbors. Um, and I've seen the way that things like mental health can criminalize people that are close to me and neighbors. So I just would um, appreciate your support. I thank so much the SST, Just Us Somerville, and ORS, and you, Joe, for having me. Thank you very much, Katya. And I want to thank both candidates for strictly adhering. I'm sorry I went over a little bit, but um, many, many thanks. Best wishes from the Somerville Media Center to you both. I want to thank Somerville Stands Together, Our Revolution Somerville, and Just Us Somerville for giving us the opportunity to bring your voices to the Somerville public. For the Somerville Media Center, I am Joe Lynch. Please remember to vote on primary day, September 1st, 2020. As always, stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time.